Hi everybody, welcome to Ace Lab 360. Uh, this time we have a special guest, Jim Malcolm here from Human Eyes, uh, the creators of the Views camera. So very cool to have you here. Uh, just a couple weeks ago you were at CES. Lots of uh, cool announcements and things. Um, I don't know, do you want to introduce what this camera is, what it does, and uh, you know, share a little bit about what this is? There you go. So let's start with what we talked about at CES. So what we broke uh, the news with at CES was the release of the Views Plus. Now the Views Plus looks very similar to the original Views camera, but with some really nice uh, improvements to it. Primarily what the camera does differently is it's a live broadcasting streaming camera. Um, in addition to adding live streaming, we've added the ability to um, uh, connect to the camera via Bluetooth. We've increased the optical properties themselves and improved the overall audio properties as well. And then a whole bunch of software stuff on the back end as well. But the Views Plus was one of our two announcements at the show. And then the other one, which is harder for me to demonstrate here, is something called the Humanized Zone, which is uh, a web-based VR sharing platform that allows you to go to a 2D browser, build a VR website, and then send VR websites to a headset using a standard browser and not having to download an application. We can talk about that later. Yeah, well, that sounds really cool. I don't know, Fatma, you've been watching, you've been talking yes. a lot about 360 video in general, you've been keeping an eye on these things, so I don't know if you have any. I mean, also, you mentioned, I think the app also got updated? Yep, so we also released a new app uh, app version which is both forward compatible as well as backwards compatible to existing views. Um, on the Android platform you now can preview all four cameras and then on both Android and iOS you can set your exposure values before you shoot. So in the past you were able to adjust your exposure values after you shot um, but that was just basically a, a curve correction. Now you can actually go in and change your EV values and change your exposure settings by camera prior to shooting. And then that interface between the phone and the camera, is that always, is it Bluetooth or is there? So it is Wi-Fi, it's a Wi-Fi connection, so you connect your mobile phone to the camera via Wi-Fi. Um, because we do now have Bluetooth in the camera, which is, it's real intent is to sync audio feeds. Mm -hmm. Um, but I am working with the engineers to say, can we connect to the camera via USB for camera control, or not USB, but uh, Bluetooth for camera control. And uh, they're working on giving me an answer. Okay, so that's kind of the what the product is. Um, you know, stepping it back a little bit, I mean, what is your target? Like, who, who is the target market, the expected folks that will be interested in this, should be thinking about getting it? I mean, where were you aiming? Because there's so many different cameras, everyone has something different to offer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what's the thinking about the target market for this? So there's a really broad audience for the Views camera. Um, I, if you look at the early adopters, what we tend to see are, are filmmakers or videographers who are currently shooting in 4K. Um, they usually have client bases and their clients are saying, oh, I keep hearing this VR thing, what do I do with it? Um, and so they're able to cost effectively make VR linear VR video content for their clients. Now, that's kind of the least common denominator. You start layering on top of that, ad agencies and production companies that are also trying to answer for their clients, how are we going to produce? Then the education vertical is huge, right? So originally we had teachers wanting to record classes and instruction in VR that they can broadcast out. But more importantly now, we have institutions that are coming to us trying to figure out how do we add a curriculum about virtual reality video creation or virtual reality in general. And they're finding that using the views camera, they can teach the principles of VR storytelling without the hurdle of teaching the students to become computer programmers. Okay. So it's it's not necessarily the, um, the standard, you know, just pure consumer, someone who you know, is used to just doing video with their phone. It, that's not necessarily purely the, that target. That's a, you know, you raise a really interesting piece because it's one of the biggest hurdles we have to overcome right now because if you look at products like the Ricoh Theta that you can get spherical 360 video onto your mobile phone, unfortunately the industry has not done a good job of making the differentiation between 360 video and VR video. And so those technologies like, you know, pick on Theta that easily move video content onto your phone in a spherical format they don't necessarily do any stitching. 
And so you can view a spherical video. But if you put that spherical video in a VR headset, you're watching it in a monoscopic view. In other words, it's a flat field, almost like if you were to put a poster around your head and you look around. And it's just, it's not believable. And I wish I had a better technical term, but it's very uncomfortable. Um, what the Views camera does is an entirely different class of technology, and it actually creates what's referred to as VR video, where you have two photospheres, one for your left eye, one for your right eye, so that you have depth perception, and then four separate microphones to capture first order ambisonics. So it is a camera that is purpose built to create content for VR headsets. For the audio, you're also partnering with the company. That's, that's right. So our expertise is uh, video and the software side and the, the kind of visuals of it. Um, we team with a company called Visisonics, who are leaders in VR audio or spatial audio space. Um, they've helped us to architect the camera itself to take those four individual video or audio paths and turn it into first order ambisonics. Um, when you buy the camera, they also give you a license for six months to their software, which is an extended opportunity for you to then take mono tracks and lay them into the VR experience so you can script sound uh, around somebody. Okay. So uh, great. So that big differentiator between the you know the entry level 360 cameras, uh, you know, which are in the 200 to 300 dollar range, is that you know those cameras are not capturing stereoscopic depth in any way. You're just you're capturing video from every direction. Um, GoPros and Gear 360s and and things like that, but um, so this is a bit of a step up. It's not quite you know cinematic production where you might go to a Jaunt VR or an Ozo, you know, plural tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, this is actually the the original Views camera. That's still available, right? I mean, that's still an ongoing product, the, right? That's right. So the the original Views is still in the market. It's seven hundred and ninety nine dollars. Mm -hmm. The Views Plus, which adds the streaming and the optics and the other pieces of the, the technology as well, one thousand one ninety five. So okay. basically twelve hundred dollars. And so the big differentiator in in that in between range is the fact that this is shooting genuine stereoscopically, you've got a left and a right eye for every direction around the camera, so that when you are watching this with a headset stereoscopically, you can perceive all the depth of everything that was around the camera. That's right. And, and regardless of which camera you shoot with today, um, you had mentioned the Ozo, uh, which is, unfortunately, they went out of business, but there's still plenty of them in circulation out there. Um, all the way up to a jaunt. Um, Yee's got some interesting products. The um, Insta Pro is out there at $3,500. All of these technologies are very um, uh, interesting, but when you put them into a VR headset, because the image quality is ultimately defined by the resolution of the headset, not the resolution of the camera, today, they all basically look the same, right? So if you are a purist and you want to be able to record at ridiculously high resolution so that if and when someday, right, <laughs> headsets catch up, then yes, maybe you want to buy it and, and shoot at a higher resolution. But there's really no reason for anybody, regardless of where you are in a production level, to get started in VR video with something like the Views camera today. Right. And uh, that's what's really you know, interesting and for, for me. I, I come from having to build my own 360 cameras from scratch, you know, cutting aluminum and you know, strapping cameras together and, and recording decks. Um, and, and then there's the full stitching process, which was another hurdle in itself. Whereas this is effectively turnkey, um, so a little box about the size of a sandwich, really. Um, and then it comes with the software to perform the actual stitching. Um, so, so that's really great. I mean, it is a fantastic way of getting started. Where do you see as the limitations of this versus shooting with you know a standard video camera every day um, versus you know a 360 non stereoscopic camera? I mean, are, are the things that people should be prepared for if they're getting one of these for the first time? Say, wow, I just you know that was a lot of money out of my pocket to get this, and you know what, what should I be prepared for you know planning wise and using a camera like this? Yeah, so I think that the most kind of underscoped part of the ecosystem right now is the computer itself. Uh, the Views camera creates about one gigabyte of data for every one minute of recording. Um, 
when you transfer that over to the computer, this is where we do the actual stitching in our software. And if you have a PC with something like an NVIDIA 1070 card or, or something about that class, it takes about one minute to render one minute worth of video. But if we output that at 120 megabits per second, so then I'm gonna have my finished video is 500 megabytes a minute, plus I've got my original data at one gigabyte a minute, so you know, upwards in a project, you're dealing with about two gigabytes of data for every one minute of recording. And I think that people get surprised of how much information is really needed to bring VR video to life. And if anybody starts to go, oh, what have I done? It's because they underscoped the resource requirement on their computer. So lots of storage. <laughs> lots of storage, a decent GPU. The GPU is much more important than the uh, CPU on the computer. For example, the NVIDIA 1070 card that's in this MSI laptop up here has got 1920 CUDA cores inside that GPU. So we can take an assignment from our software, send it to the GPU, distribute it across 1900 cores, and return the result almost instantly. Um, if you try to do stitching on the CPU of your computer, it will take maybe 14 minutes to render one minute of video or so which unfortunately is one of the challenges we have with the, the Macintosh or the Apple platform uh, because their GPUs just don't have the horsepower needed to render VR video. Mm -hmm. but I, think I was using a Mac uh, to try to render my videos and then it, it was just very slow. Yeah. And then now in the labs we have, uh, Mac, not Mac, but like PC computers and it's so much faster and so much easier. And, uh, right, and all those PCs, yeah, so they have exactly. 1080 boards. So this yes. laptop's a 1070. Our, most of our workstations have 1080s, yeah. um, so that's uh, definitely, and again, it's, you know, 1,000 or more cores, 2,000 cores, uh, that's really what makes a GPU so interesting, is in, for, particularly for video. Video is the same operation many, many times over, over you know, all these different pixels. Um, it's ideal for parallel computing, where CPUs are architected for, okay, I'm going to do this calculation, and this calculation, and this calculation, in, in order. And, it's exciting when you have 20 CPUs, but compared to 1,400 uh, cores on a GPU, things move really, really quickly. Yeah. And, and before too many letters come in about my comment about Mac, uh, but <laughs> just, just, for my, just for my reference, right? So I have this, this laptop, as it happens to be a $1,500 laptop. I went out and bought the state-of-the-art MacBook Pro, because I'm a Macaholic myself. Um, about three thousand or two hundred dollars, um, and it does take me about one eleven minutes to render a minute of video on my Mac versus one minute for one minute on here. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it's that will change. It's uh, exactly. It's you know, everyone. That's just technology. Yeah, there's a little bit of picture. Did you have other um, questions? Yeah, I have actually about um, shooting three sixty video. What people should pay attention to: you know, camera placement, stitching lines, maybe uh, guiding the viewer's attention. Any tips or tricks that you have? So that's a great question, and, and there's a long answer to that. So I think most common misconception, I guess, when people start shooting in VR video, is that they're going to put the camera down and they're just going to record the world that's happening around them, right? So I ask them, would you do that with a framed traditional video camera, right? So if you're going to go to a trade show, would you just set a camera up and record everything that's happening in the booth? And they say, of course not. I would tell a story. And that's exactly what you should be doing in virtual reality video. You have to create the story. And if it's um, a subject moving through a frame, maybe I'm not gonna pan that subject to the frame, but I have to block my actors, I have to script my actors so that when they walk through the frame, I allow my viewer to be able to decide whether they want to watch that person walk through the frame, what the purpose of that is, use sound triggers, like so. <laughs> VR video is much, much, much more difficult to produce and to create than simply putting the camera down and recording content. And the real engaging work is when there's a story and a dialogue behind it, and then that reaches into branch dialogues and all kinds of different things. So. And so, you know, human eyes, this camera, the product views, it, it's all fairly new. Um, presumably you were doing something differently before all of these technologies came about. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, what's your vision for where this is going? Something attracted you to, you know, getting involved in this in the first place. And there must be this trajectory that it's heading in. You know, so wh what do you see? 
So um, I believe all of us are going to live part of our life in virtual reality of the future. And if you are a creator today, you really have three screens that you create for, right? So you create for a TV screen that maybe is hanging on the wall in the living room. You create for a computer screen um, that's sitting on the desk. You create for a mobile phone that's in your hand. There is a fourth screen coming, and that is your VR headset. And so if you are a creator and a storyteller, then it's how do I tell a story for that fourth screen? Now, admittedly, there's only about 15 million of those uh, fourth screens in the market today. And they're big and heavy and have nicknames like a scoop mask, right? So not, not the friendly thing. But they are getting lighter. They're getting higher resolution. They're getting so they don't get quite as hot on your head and all those types of things. So if you think about the opportunity to create a for a fourth screen, that's what brought me into this industry. I've been in the imaging space my whole life. I started as a photographer. I launched Smithsonian into digital photography back then. Took pictures onto floppy disks. Um, I went to Rico Imaging. Um, we purchased Pentax and did all kinds of things on high-end imaging. I launched the Rico Theta over there and started this whole world of spherical. I quickly realized that for spherical to really be believable in a headset, you needed 3D. And that's where Humanize uh, comes in. Humanize has been in business as a company for about 17 years, specializing in 3D printing, computer animation, and 3D graphics. So they are uniquely positioned to uh, build a platform that enables you to create for that fourth screen. And that's why I decided to come into this space and, and team with the folks at Humanize Technologies and, and bring the views camera to market. Fantastic, thanks. Um, we're pretty much out of time for this episode. We should have you back a few more times and maybe get into some more of the technical aspects of this and some tricks and tips and that kind of thing. I'm happy to jump in anytime, just let me know. All right, thanks. So until next time, have fun.